because Justin Herbert was drafted one spot after you, I kind of feel like your careers will always be intertwined, you know? How do you feel about that comparison that will forever be made? Well, I, I just think that's, you know, that's just something that's gonna have to be dealt with in the media. I mean, I have no animosity towards, <laughs> towards Justin Herbert. And for me, it's not even a competition between me and him. Um, it's a competition for, for myself to go out and, you know, see what I can do to help our team be successful against their defense. Um, you know, and I'm pretty sure it's the same for, for Justin as well. Yeah, he's been a really great guy to watch. Um, he's been fun to watch and um, he's had so much success over the past couple of years that, uh, you know, it's been great to watch him and, and all the things he's done. So uh, really looking forward to playing against him this week and, and saying hi. You know, wouldn't you like to see one of these guys say, I really hate that guy. I just despise <laughs> him. I want to beat his brains out. You know, it's they never do that. And, and, and frankly, frankly, how do I word this? I think we've gotten a taste of that kind of personality for the last few years, and I could do without it for a while. Let me just leave it at that. Um, so uh, that said, <laughs> Herbert and Tua getting together this weekend, pick number five and pick number six in the draft. And this one is fascinating. It's kind of like Peyton Manning, Ryan Leaf light because the Dolphins could have taken either guy. They took Tua. Herbert is the leftover that the Chargers settled for. So far, Herbert has looked better than Tua. We've seen more of him. Fascinating uh, matchup. And, and, and I hope they cross paths frequently. And in theory, they could play every year, depending upon where they finish in their division. But I hope we see a lot of Tua and Justin Herbert in the coming years. You know, Mike, I, I, I've thought this ever since the draft. And then early in the season, when we're all saying, oh my God, look at Justin Herbert. Man, was he pro ready. And you know, looking back on Hard Knocks, when Justin Herbert was very, very painfully honest about himself a few times in that show about how, oh man, I blew that one. Or, you know, he was very self-deprecating. But the larger point is this, Mike. There was a little bit of an aura about Justin Herbert coming out of Oregon, and here's why. Over the last two years, when he got to be a very prominent top 10 prospect, okay, what would happen? Okay, NFL scouts knew all about him, but the average people, other than absolute college football nerds or reporters, okay, said, I'm not staying up to watch him at 10.30 every Saturday night, you know, because their games are on, their games are on so late. And meanwhile, Tua's on the Gary Danielson game every week. You know, he's on national TV almost every week. So you know everything about Tua, and you know about one tenth as much about Justin Herbert, and so I always I felt coming into this year that of the three quarterbacks, I said Burrow, he's gonna kill it, and of course he is. But the other two guys, we knew a lot about Tua, and there was a little bit of a shroud around Justin Herbert that he is just totally ripped off in the first half of this season. And just the circumstances pursuant to which he entered the fray for the first time. Tyrod Taylor, the misadventures with a needle aimed at numbing yeah. a rib injury, punctures a lung. Literally a moment's notice for Justin Herbert, and he never looks back. The only unfortunate aspect of it is, Peter, that the Chargers haven't been able to rise to that same level. They're two and six. As my son said over the weekend, they must be the worst two and six or the best two and six team in league history. Uh, they're in every game. They've blown three 17-point leads. They had a fluky little almost won the game last week. Horrible clock management down the stretch, so they would have had more chances at the end zone to beat the Raiders. And, and as I said the other day, Herbert is playing just well enough, and the team is playing just poorly enough to get everybody fired after this season because what a prime job that would be if that comes open with Justin Herbert there for the next 10 or 15 years. Yeah, I mean, look, uh, if they continue on this path, it's going to be very easy for uh, the Spanos family to basically say, we got to make a change. I can tell you this right now, Mike, they absolutely unequivocally do not want to get rid of Anthony Lynn. They love Anthony Lynn. 
but you know you you, you got to stop the bleeding at some point and and so this game becomes really important just like the rest of them do but you know look i'll say this also about the dolphins you know at the beginning of the year i picked them to win the division and i didn't really know why i just knew that i really like brian flores i liked what they were doing and i figured that at some point during the year two would play and he would start to if not dominate play very influential football both running and throwing and so far he he has it's only been two games but i think he's shown promise but the thing about the miami team right now mike that gets buried by you know the tua show their defense is really really good i think their defense potentially is top three to five by the end of this year the pass rushing emmanuel ogba uh the 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 uh the excellent play to not let the perimeter players take over games i think is really shown in their four game winning streak yeah and consider they started 0 and 2 and they've really turned it around brian flora is a guy that you have to consider for coach of the year along with a kevin stefanski in cleveland that will be determined over the balance of the season uh, Bengals Steelers on Sunday crazy issue with the Steelers Ben Roethlisberger has injuries to both knees he's on the COVID-19 reserve list because as you mentioned early in the program he sat next to Vance McDonald on the flight home from Dallas McDonald turned out to be positive for COVID-19 on Sunday and was shedding virus they expect Ben to play Jay Glazer said last night they're going to have a longer practice on Saturday not just a normal walkthrough to help Ben make up for lost time but here comes Burrow with two weeks to get ready and when I spoke to Burrow after their upset win of the Titans. I I tried to, yeah, I just threw it out there because, you know, they always say we're taking it one game at a time. Well, he didn't. He said, you know, the next four or five games are very, very winnable. And then it's like, yeah, Steelers coming up. But he's, he's not lacking in confidence. And that's something that right. the Bengals organization has been lacking for a very long time. I like the moxie. I like the attitude. I like the hatred, the loathing of losing. And I wouldn't be surprised, Peter, if they go in there and 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 steal one from Pittsburgh because Pittsburgh has been living so dangerously most of its games the opening is there if the Bengals can can find a way to cram through it I thought what was really significant about the game against Tennessee not that uh, Burrow uh, you know didn't throw an interception was very accurate in the game uh, played a very confident game I watched a lot of the game played a very confident game. But the most significant thing is, first game since he became an NFL quarterback, that Joe Burrow was not sacked. So I think what Zach Taylor is beginning to understand and to realize is that there are some things he wants to do with Joe Burrow in getting him to sit back there, read, read, read. But now he realizes we may not have the opportunity or the time to do all that. Let's get the ball out faster. Let's have him be a little bit more mobile in the pocket. And that's going to become a strength. So to me, especially in a week that you're playing a great pass rush in the Steelers, to cut, be coming off a zero sack game, huge for Zach Taylor, the play caller, and obviously for Joe Burrow. And that is the red flag for all three of these quarterbacks, the potential for injury. We've seen Burrow and Herbert get hit a lot, and we know to his history, they got to stay healthy. Do you feel like with guys like you and Josh and, and even Russell before that, with the way the quarterback position is going, is this is this what quarterback's going to be going forward? Rather, not really having the just the stand guy in the pocket, you're going to have to have these guys that move around as much as you guys do. I mean, <laughs> if I was a coach, uh, I, I like a guy that can do both um, just because, you know, you got options. You got, um, you know, it opens up the offense a little bit more. You're uh, a lot more dynamic. Uh, get out of sticky situations. Uh, and then in football, especially in the NFL, there's going to be a lot of sticky sticky situations because everybody's so good. Um, so that, that's just my, uh, that's my take on it. Kyler Murray, Cardinals quarterback first quarterback possibly to have 4,000 yards passing and 1,000 yards rushing. He's on pace to do that through half of the season. And he's phenomenal. And it's easy to say, let him run the ball when no one can catch him. But boy, what he's done this year, Peter, has been phenomenal. And we get another test this weekend. And it's 
as big, if not bigger, of a test than what we saw last week when the Dolphins went to Arizona and beat the Cardinals and Kyler Murray. It's Josh Allen now, fresh from beating the Seahawks, coming to town. Allen, a guy who can run the ball. Murray, a guy who can run the ball as well as any quarterback who's ever played the game. A great, great game looming on Sunday afternoon between these two teams. I bet the NFL never thought when they scheduled Buffalo at Arizona that it would be <laughs> the game of the week. I can't think of a time in NFL history, seriously, when Buffalo, when the Bills and Cardinals would ever have been the game of the week. This is the game of the week this week. Now, after Josh Allen sort of resuscitated himself last week with a great performance, I mean, that was a tremendous performance outdueling Russell Wilson. I mean, it helps that his defense really badgered Russell Wilson, no pun intended. And 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 obviously, uh, you know, the Seattle defense was not as stout against Josh Allen. But I'll just say this. These two quarterbacks, the reason that it's so cool, I didn't think I would be talking about Kyler Murray like, hey, he's a threat to throw for 400 every week. But I mean, he's thrown for 380 and 360 in two of the last three or four weeks. And he's such a threat to run the ball. And Mike, I look at Kyler Murray right now, and with we are in the golden age of NFL playmakers. DK Metcalf, Russell Wilson, Patrick Mahomes, DeAndre Hopkins, uh, Michael Thomas. I mean, there, there's so many great offensive playmakers, Alvin Kamara. But right now, to me, the most fun individual to watch in the NFL is Kyler Murray because his running ability is, it, it, it's, it's, more, it's more of a threat in my opinion than Michael Vick was because he just has the ability to outrun anybody on your defense. I, I just, I think he is at the ver on the verge really of exploding as a huge player in the NFL. You know, I've said all year, he's got a combination of speed, agility, and awareness that the NFL has never before seen. And people argue, well, what about Mike Vick? What about Lamar Jackson? Well, Vick didn't have the awareness. He got hit too many times. Lamar Jackson gets hit too many times. Kyler Murray will do everything it takes for the most part. I think he let his competitiveness get the best of him at times last week. Took a big hit on a third and one play, and I think that's one of the reasons why they didn't let him run it on fourth and one and did a shotgun handoff to Chase Edmonds instead. But usually, you do the lateral hook slide, the step out of bounds. He reins in that desire to get a few extra yards and show what he can do. He knows where everyone else is at all times. It's amazing. It's almost like, Peter, and, and, and I think one of the things that makes him so fascinating is because he's so short. It's like a kid got onto the yeah. field and they can't catch him, you know? And, and that's what makes it like if he was prototypical quarterback size, it wouldn't be as exciting. It's more exciting because he's so much smaller than the guys who are chasing him. You know, uh, last year at training camp, when I met Kyler Murray, um, you know, I felt like, honestly, I felt like I was standing and talking to Russell Wilson because they're my height. You know, Russell Wilson, Drew Brees, Kyler Murray, even though Kyler Murray probably is, what, an inch shorter than Brees, but, you know, all about the same. And you just say, this is really different. When you're, when you're talking to Cam Newton, you're looking up like him, looking up at him like he's a power forward in the NBA. But I think that really, the fact that he's kind of slight and the fact that even though he, when you say he's slight, you clap him on the shoulder, he's, he's made a rock. He, he really is. And so to me, I think that really helps him, the fact that he's slight and he hasn't taken the big hits. And Mike, listen, the one other thing about Kyler Murray, in my opinion, that we've seen, and we said, hey, there will be growth in his game as he adapts from the college game where you use your legs so much, you can't use your legs as much in the NFL. You've got to learn to be an accurate, efficient passer. Mike, the last two weeks, Kyler Murray in hugely competitive games is a 74% passer. And look, that's a snapshot. That's not a career. I get it. But that is a great sign that he is taking that next step. You're not going to survive in the NFL completing 57, 58%. 
If you start to get to 65, 66, 67, that is, without taking the huge hits, that is a long-term star in the NFL for Kyler Murray. And there's so much they can do with that offense as he gets more comfortable. We've seen more designed runs. We see the passing out of the read option look, which can can give a defense. You know, you, you combine, you take the RPO and the read option and you put it together because a lot of the teams that do the RPO, their quarterback isn't a real threat to run like Nick Foles in Philly a few years ago. But when you have the run threat by the tailback, the run threat by the quarterback, the pass threat by the quarterback, how in the hell do you begin to defend that on a consistent basis when your guys are, are stopping two or three different times to figure out what the hell the play is going to be? And defenses, I think, are going to be a key for this Bills-Cardinals game. Neither has a defense that you really put a ton of trust in. And look, the Bills, I think, have a much clearer path to the playoffs than the Cardinals because the Cardinals are caught in this cluster of NFC teams that are all around 5-3, and 6-2. and two. Somebody's going to fall out of that and not make it to the top seven and uh, you know for the Cardinals for all the impressive wins they've had th that loss last week could really hurt them if they follow up with another one to an yeah. AFC East team that's coming out to play them in their own building yeah you know the thing that would really kind of bother me about that loss last week Mike is I thought they made a couple of huge errors down the stretch play calling and coaching first of all Kyler Murray not completing on third and one at the two minute warning, not either completing a pass. And to me, you know, or running for it, he threw to Kirk, it was incomplete. To me, if you're Cliff Kingsbury right there and you're down by three points and you look at what kind of game this is, okay, to me, you got to be in four down territory at that point. Third and one with Kyler Murray, your quarterback, you can't choose to kick a 49-yard field goal, period, or 48 yards, whatever it was. And, and again, look, you ought to be able to make in a weatherless place a 48 or 49-yard field goal. I get it. But it's not a gimme. It's not an extra point. And, and to me, that would bother me about that, you know, sort of the thought process behind that. When you've got third and one and you're at the two-minute warning and you have to score, and you, why do you want to tie the game and give the ball to Tua Tonga Valoa with two timeouts left, I think, and a minute 55? It just, it, to me, it made no sense. But anyway, it is what it is. So well, I guess the, well, valuable the point lesson, I'm making. Valuable lesson learned. Valuable lesson learned by Cliff Kingsbury, too. You'd send your kicker out there and he can't make a 49-yarder. It comes up short. You'll never do that again. Well, I mean, I should hope not, but if you can't, but Mike, if you can't trust your kicker to make a 49 yard field goal, you better get another kicker. I mean, you know, especially in a climateless place. It's not like there were 20 mile an hour crosswinds in front of them. So to me, I mean, I look, I don't know if they go for it on fourth and one, if they would have made it or if they would have scored a touchdown and one thing. I, I don't know. All I know is that was a bad decision at the two-minute warning. Yeah, I agree with you completely. When you have a player like Kyler Murray, you know, and that, that's where the analytics has to yield to who you have, who they have, how you feel about the player. I bet the available. analytics said what you, you got to go guys for it. Can do. Yeah. <laughs> well, Kyler, Kyler Murray's skills tell me you got to go for it. And, and uh, yeah. uh, hopefully that'll happen the next time the Cardinals are in that situation. All right, Seahawks and the Rams getting together. A very important game for the Rams. They're clinging to the seventh seed right now in the NFC. They win. They move into a tie with the Seahawks and possibly with the Cardinals for first place. I mean, we could have a three-way tie for first place in the NFC West by the time we get to the end of the day on Sunday. Uh, here's Aaron Donald, the all-world, all-universe defensive tackle, talking about the challenge that comes from trying to defend a guy like Russell Wilson. Well, it's always a challenge when you're playing against a, you know, a, a great quarterback like him that can do so much, um, make so much things happen with his arm, with his feet, you know. Um, so he, he, he's definitely a special type of player. You know, he make our job a lot harder, but we just got to try to, you know, you know, do our job as far as up front to, you know, put pressure on him, make him uncomfortable, um, get to him, you know. So, you know, we won't have a, so he won't have an opportunity to have a day that, you know, that he wants, so. You know, this time where I had him wrapped up and he still found a way to get the ball away. Um, so, um, you know, it, it made my job harder, but, 
you know, we, we, we definitely prepared and ready for that challenge this week, though. I don't know if he had something under his shirt or if he just has muscles that big on his back. <laughs> this new Darren Donald is what a physical specimen. And, uh, yeah, Donald trying to chase around Russell Wilson. And uh, the Seahawks have put it all in Russ's hands this year because what else are they going to do? The defense was exposed yet again. Yes, they have DK Metcalf, a real challenge this week with Jalen Ramsey on DK Metcalf. The running game, everybody's banged up. It's not like it used to be. Um, and th this is this is a, a huge, huge kind of is this plan for the Seahawks working type of a game. They fall to six and three. Maybe this let Russ cook thing isn't going to be, you know, the answer to what the Seahawks have been looking for as they try to get back to Super Bowl form. If they can win it and move to seven and two and strengthen their grip on first place in the division, we're going to feel differently about it. So th this is a huge, I think, per perception game. How we're going to feel about these Seahawks is going to hinge on whether or not they can go to L.A. and beat the Rams. Look, you know, it's the same old story. We saw it at the beginning of the year. You know, we said that if Seattle's defense is good enough, they're going to go a long way. Mike, in the last three weeks... The Seahawks have scored 34, 37, and 34 points. Should be enough to win. They've lost two of those games. And so when you look at the way they're playing, and look, last week, that's on Russell Wilson. He turned it over too much. I get it. He handed Buffalo good field position and points. I get it. But in general, Russell Wilson is not a turnover machine. He just isn't. And, and so now you have to hope with Jamal Adams coming in healthy, theoretically now, and with Snacks Harrison probably uh, in line to come back starting next week uh, for Seattle. I look at Seattle as getting two boosts to a bad defense that they desperately, desperately need. And to me, it was just, it was sort of a shame that they were not able to, to really uh, make a deal for a really good pass rusher before the draft or before the trade deadline. Now, Carlos Dunlop uh, is is a good pass rusher, but to me, I really I had hoped for Seattle's sake that they could have gotten Ryan Kerrigan because I think Ke Ryan Kerrigan's got a little bit more left in the tank than Dunlop does, but we'll see. And you know the fact that the defense isn't getting it done, maybe putting more pressure on Russell Wilson to try to do more, and as a result making more mistakes. Turnovers are up for Wilson. And he has gone from being the clear-cut, no-question, no-brainer MVP candidate to a guy who's starting to see some of these other potential candidates catch up to him. Patrick Mahomes, I think, is the one he needs to be concerned about the most. Mahomes is having statistically an off-the-chart season. Wilson at one point was. But, Peter, four turnovers last weekend for Russell Wilson. You can't keep doing that. And keep the team on the right track and maintain that kind of MVP presumption. Every once in a while, you get a guy who gets that, that shine, that feeling early in the season. He's the MVP. That's going to go away soon if they keep losing. And if he keeps coughing up the ball the way he did last week. Yeah, that's right, Mike. And that's why the MVP, I've always said this, the MVP is a 16 game award. It's not a week nine award. And if I had to vote right now, I still probably would vote Russell Wilson. But you're right. Mahomes is having an absolutely ridiculous year. His team is 8-1 and one versus Russell Wilson 6-2. and two, And I get that. But, you know, we'll see at the end of the year. That's why, you know, I really, you know, every week when somebody says, well, you know, now the MVP is, uh, is Patrick Mahomes. And, you know, and I get everybody saying, well, you know, now such and such is the MVP. But really, to be fair, you've got to make sure that you make this a 16-week or a 16-game award and don't go too crazy with any one specific game. Look at how one game, though, can change the odds, Peter. The points bet odds from last week to this week. It's tightened yep. considerably at the top between Wilson and Mahomes. Aaron Rodgers, a significant jump 
from plus 1,000 to plus 4,000 or 400, meaning if you bet 100, you only win 400. It used to be just a week ago, if you bet 100, you'd win 1,000. Tom Brady way down. Drew Brees way up from plus 15,000 to plus 4,000. Then there's Dalvin Cook, the non-quarterback on the list, who if he keeps doing what he's done the last few weeks, he's going to be the MVP when the 16th game is played, Peter. Yeah, hey, look, Dalvin Cook, uh, you know, I'm sure he really cares about this, but, I mean, he's been one of my offensive players of the week two weeks in a row, and I hate doing that because in many weeks you could just say, hey, give it to Aaron Rodgers or, or, or Mahomes or whatever. So I try to spread it around, but he has been so dominant. And in being that dominant, Mike, what you've seen is that's the true meaning of the Most Valuable Player Award. You know, Gary Kubiak, in essence has basically gone away from this being Kirk Cousins' offense. This is Dalvin Cook's offense, and to a much lesser degree, Alexander Madison. But this is an offense now that scares the crap out of you just simply by running the ball. Hey, it's like what Bill Parcells used to say in the 80s. I remember he used to say, we don't have many running plays. We just keep throwing them at you and say, hey, stop us. And and for a long time with Joe Morris and, you know, people couldn't do that. I think it's going to be the same way with the Vikings. If the Vikings advance to go to the playoffs, if they absolutely right their ship and go to the playoffs, there's no question that you have to give, and and it continues like this, you got to give Dalvin Cook consideration. Next test may be one of the biggest because last year that running game fell flat in Soldier Field against the Bears. They'll get a chance to make it better on Monday night when they go back to Chicago. One quick betting note before we move to the next game. I thought of it when we looked at the MVP odds. I don't know if you saw this, Peter. Somebody actually bet $99,000 on the Packers at minus 1,100 odds to win straight up against the Jaguars. If the Packers win, the person makes $9,000. If they lose, $99,000 goes away forever. I don't understand the upside but that's the bet that was made. Well, I guess you say, is Jake Luton, I don't even know, is he the quarterback playing for Jacksonville this week? Yes. Is Jake yes. Luton going in, going into Lambeau and slaying Aaron Rodgers? Honestly, Mike, I, if I had money to throw around, I'd probably make that bet. And I know it's an on any given Sunday deal, but how possibly is, uh, you know, is that... Is that illogical to think? Now, I understand that the risk is big here, obviously, if you lose, but somebody betting $99,000 probably doesn't have to worry about losing $99,000. Exactly. So why do you care about winning $9,000, right? Like, who cares? It's probably part of it. It's probably part of a strategy. You know, you make, you probably make, who knows? Maybe you make 100 bets a week. And you just say, okay, I'm going to make bets on the following and blah, blah, blah. I mean, gambling to me is insane because nobody ever, ever, ever is going to build a mansion gambling on football. And I know everybody's, oh, well, wait a second. Look at this guy here. Look at this guy there. You tell me over a five-year period, you show me any guy who has won 68% of his bets on football I will be shocked. It's just, it's too hard. It's too hard. And it's a ton of anxiety, even if you win. And I think for me, the, the, the losses would hurt so much more than the wins would feel good. It ain't worth it, especially to put up 99,000 in the hopes of winning a measly 9,000. And let's move on by saying this, go Jaguars. All right, 49ers at the Saints. <laughs> last, year, last year, it was one of the best games of the regular season. The fourth down catch by George Kittle, and he's rumbling, bumbling, and stumbling, and it was awesome, and the 49ers established themselves. Now the 49ers, you never know what you're going to get from them. I, I got to give Kyle Shanahan a ton of credit for what he's made this team into with so many injuries. But the 49ers lose 34-17 last Thursday night. The Saints destroy the Buccaneers 38-3. I guess it would be fitting if now the 49ers beat the Saints, Peter. Do you see that happening? I mean, I think it is highly, highly unlikely, Mike. I don't see how they can give them a great game. 
either, especially after what we saw with the Saints last week. The problem is, Mike, these 49ers with this team and this talent playing this week, they can't score enough. They simply cannot score enough. And I don't just put the, the it really, it was, on, honestly, it was a 10-point game that they had against the Packers last week. It was a garbage time touchdown that made it 17 that the Packers are saying, ah, whatever. Um, so, but, but, but I just don't see any way right now that, you know, the 49ers, the 49ers are going to have to score high 20s to even have a chance to win this game. I just don't see it. Yeah, I, I don't either, but you know what? I thought the Buccaneers were going to win last week too over the Saints and we ended up being wrong. So you never know. That's why they play the games as Chris Berman would say. Here's Drew Brees on the Saints that are now 6-2 and hitting their stride. I think each week we've gotten a little bit better. I mean, it's been been an unusual season, especially, I think, um, offensively over the last four or five weeks just because of the amount of personnel turnover um, with guys being injured and that kind of thing. So I feel like, in a way, we're just hitting our stride a little bit. Um, You know, getting Michael Thomas back, I think he's going to continue to – kind of get back into form, um, you know, with the more reps um, and just kind of coming back off the injury. Emmanuel Sanders as well. Um, and, and obviously just the more time that we have together. So um, that combined with the guys that we already have and, and the young guys that we have that can contribute as well, um, you know, I'm excited to see our evolution. It really is impressive in hindsight how they kind of held it together piled up wins none were overly impressive they had to come from 17 down on monday night to beat the chargers it's just you know the games were not the old school saints come out and steamroll you until sunday night and now with michael thomas back emmanuel sanders back from two games that he missed due to COVID 19 they used Taysom hill as well as they have at any point better than any point all year it reminded me of how they used him in the playoff loss to the vikings when he was the best player on the field that day you throw all that together and the defense stepping up the way it did this you know every week the perception changes who's the best team in the nfc who's the most complete team and that mantle passed from the buccaneers to the saints last week whether they keep it or not who knows but for now that 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 glow is over new orleans you know mike i'll tell you i talked to both peyton and breeze after the game on sunday sunday night and here's one of the things that really stood out everybody said well geez you know a kind of a slow start coming back for michael thomas but that's totally not the point there's a reason why drew Brees in the first 19 minutes of this game completed passes to 11 different players Okay, and here is the reason, the big reason, okay? And I'll give you an example. The touchdown pass to Adam Troutman, the tight end, rookie tight end from Dayton. Okay, on that touchdown pass, if you look at the wide angle view of that field, you know what you'll see? You will see split out way left, Michael Thomas. You will see split out way way right. Who do you think it'll be? Traquan Smith, maybe? Emmanuel Sanders? No, Mike Burton. And you know who Mike Burton is? He's a fullback, okay? So, and, and, and it was kind of funny. The reaction I got from Peyton and, and Breeze was sort of, well, they got to cover him. And so at that point, when you look at this play before the snap, you can see the Bucks are not positive exactly what they should be doing, but the Saints counted on the safety, making sure that Michael Thomas does not beat you over the top or on a fade, whatever. Okay, so what they did is that they capitalized on that. They ran Adam Troutman right up the uh, the post, and he caught an easy touchdown pass. And my point is, everybody when they play the Saints has a plan, but nobody thinks that it's going to be Mike Burton over on the right side as a as a wide receiver and Adam Troutman catching a huge pass to help win this game. And that's the genius of Sean Payton. He never stops looking yeah, it for is. ideas. He always believes he can implement plays, and his guys are smart enough to pick them up. They'll implement new plays in walkthroughs, in the hotel ballroom, the, the, the morning of the game, whatever it takes. He is always constantly looking for ideas that will work against the defense that they're playing that week. It's not my system, 
my way of doing things. It's who are we playing this week and how do we best exploit the weaknesses that I see in their system and get my guys in a position where they can exactly. be successful. And it worked as well as it ever could last week, 38-3, to steamrolling of the Buccaneers, a team that many, including me, were starting to believe could be the best team in the NFC. Man, my boy, Lamar got a gear not many human beings got. Game recognized game. No, he the OG, the Superman. For him to be as successful and to make the impact, the big splash in, 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 in this game, you know, not many people have done it. You know, I say Michael Vick, I say Lamar, you know, I, you know, I don't even think I'm in that in that in that stratosphere. I watched I watch Cam since uh our, you know, um everyone in the country did. Everyone know about Cam Superman, you know, doing doing his thing, you know, um and a lot of us looked up to him. Um he's a mobile quarterback. Um he do his thing. He's 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 a person who has who has took this this league by storm and especially you know, early on, the doubt that came with it. I mean, I, I, we all can relate to, you know, being a uh, second guess question, can he play? He got bust writ written all over him and things like that. And for him to succeed through it all, you know, makes him the true underdog story that we all love to root for. Cam Newton and Lamar Jackson sharing uh, appreciation for each other. And look, two of the best quarterbacks in the NFL getting together Sunday night, NBC. MVP last year, Lamar Jackson, MVP 2015, Cam Newton. Peter, I, I, I agree with everything these guys are saying. I, I just, I wish Cam Newton hadn't missed the time that he missed because to me, that felt like the moment that, you know, what they were building just completely fell apart in New England and they've been <clears throat> scrambling to try to put it all back together since Newton caught COVID-19. Yeah, I agree totally, Mike. I think they were on the path to be an interesting, probably not a playoff team, but an interesting contender this year. And who knows what the future holds, but I tend to think that any team that's down in the closing minutes by 10 points to the New York Jets probably is going to have to play for 2021. This has a potential to be an interesting game. I think, though, that if I were Baltimore... I would be thinking a lot about doing what I do best. And it's weird to think that you have the MVP quarterback on your team. But to me, I have seen so many times this year where they get the run going and it's like Dalvin Cook East. You know, they are just absolutely unstoppable a lot of times, even without Mark Ingram. So to me, if I were Baltimore, I would make sure that I had two ways to go coming into this game. But I think... I think that this is going to be a game where they run the ball an awful lot. Eddie, why are you wearing that? I'm here to throw a flag on any question that I don't want to answer. No, I'm just playing. I just came from work, uh, my other job, Foot Locker. So, yeah. Mike, Slart, do you want to ask the next one? Uh, is there a reason that you are working at Foot Locker? Um, well, when you got a punter who is 100% uh, on the season completing passes, man, it makes it tough on you. So trying to find another way to generate some in uh, income. <laughs> he goes with two jokes for why he's dressed like a referee. He never quite answered the question, but Teddy Bridgewater, he doesn't need the extra money. He's making $22 million a year, and he's earning it, Peter, with the Carolina Panthers. He's been phenomenal this year. He's one of these sneaky outside comeback of the comeback player of the year candidates. I don't know if he gets any votes. And and the fact that he played last year and went 5 and 0 will actually hurt him. But who would have ever dreamed he'd be back playing the way that he is right now? I mean, look, Teddy Bridgewater to me, I got the impression, you know, the contract that they signed him to seemed like <clears throat> You know, we really like you, but, <clears throat> you know, if they really liked him, they would have given him a five-year deal. What, they give him a three-year deal, right, Mike? And and yep. so, to me, when I look at Teddy Bridgewater, I say, you know, they looked at him and they say, hey, listen, if if you go 1-15 in 15 this year, we're taking Trevor Lawrence. <laughs> you know, so th that's what that contract said to me. And again, look, I spent a little bit of time with the offensive coaches on uh, – on Zoom one day in the offseason with Teddy Bridgewater. 
And I can tell you, Teddy Bridgewater absolutely, totally won them over in the offseason. And But there's one other person in that organization who's won me over, and that's Matt Rule. How do you think the New York Jets feel right now looking at Matt Rule being a very strong Coach of the Year candidate? Now, he's not going to win it, nor should he win it. I mean, my top three right now would be number one, Mike Tomlin, number two, Brian Flores, but number three would be Matt Rule because he has made chicken salad out of chicken feathers there. I really like the job they're doing, and that's going to be a very tough game for Tampa to win. Hi, I'm Mike Tirico, and thanks for watching. Make sure to hit subscribe for the latest news and highlights from NBC Sports.